New York, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Spark Summit East. Brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Here in Midtown at the Hilton Hotel. This is Spark Summit East, and this is the Cube. The Cube goes out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. Jack Norris is here. He's the CMO of MapR, longtime Cube alum. Jack, it's it's great to see you again. Hey, thank you, you know, Dave. You, you've been here since the the beginning of this whole big data meme. And it might have started here. I don't know. I think we've yeah, come I, full I think, circle. I think you're right. I mean, it really did start, and I think in this building it was our first big data show with the original, you know, Hadoop world. And, uh, and you guys, like I say, have been there from, from the start. Uh, you were kind of impatient early on. You said, you know, we're just going to go build solutions and, uh, and ignore the noise. And you built a really nice, nice business. Um, you guys have been growing. You're growing your sales force. And, uh, and things are good. And all of a sudden, boom, the spark thing you know, comes in. So we're seeing the evolution. You know, I remember saying to George, in the early days of Hadoop, we were geeking out, talking about all the bits and bytes. And then it turned into a business discussion. It's like we're back to the hardcore bits and bytes. So give us the update from MapR's point of view. Where are we in uh, the whole big data space? Well, I think, um, I think it has transitioned. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the typical large fortune company, the, the web 2.0s, it's really how do we best leverage our data? And how do we leverage our data in that we can, we can make decisions much faster, right? That high frequency decision making process. Um, and typically that involves taking production data and analytics and joining them together so that you're actually impacting business as it happens. And to do that effectively requires um, innovations. So the exciting thing about, about Spark is taking and, uh, and having a distributed compute engine that's much easier to develop and, uh, and much faster. So in the, remember the early days we'd be at these shows and, and the big question was, you know, can you take the humans out of the equation? It's like, no, no, humans are the last mile. Um, is, that, is that changing? Or we still need that human interaction? Or well, I think, I think that? Um, humans are important part of the process, but increasingly, if you can adjust and make you know, small algorithmic decisions um, and, and make those decisions at that kind of moment of truth, you get big impact. And I'll give you a few examples. So, um, ad platforms, you know, Rubicon project, over 100 billion ad auctions a day. You know, humans part of that process in terms of setting that up and reviewing the process, but each, you know, each supply and demand decision there is an automated decision. Optimizing that has a huge impact on the bottom line. Um, fraud, uh, you know, credit card, sw swiping that transaction and deciding is this fraudulent or not, avoiding false positives, et cetera, a big leveraged item. So we're seeing things like that across manufacturing, across retail, healthcare, and um, it isn't about asking bigger questions or doing reports and looking back at you know, what happened last week. It's more how can I have an infrastructure in place that allows this organization to be agile? Because it's not the companies with the most data that's going to win, it's the companies that are the most agile in making intelligent so, adjustments. So much data, humans can't ingest it any faster. I mean, we just, we're, we're, we can't keep up. So, the world needs you know, data scientists, it needs trained developers. You got some news I want to talk about on, on the training side. But even that, we can only throw so many bodies at the problem, so it's really software that's going to allow us to scale. Yeah. Software's hard, software takes time. So we've seen a lot of the spend in this analytics big data world on, on services, and obviously you guys and others have been working hard to shift it towards software. I want to come back to that training issue. We heard this morning about uh, Databricks launched a MOOC, they train 20,000 people. It's a lot, but still, a long way to go. You guys are putting some investment into training. Talk about that news. Yeah, um, well, it starts at the underlying software. If you can do things on the platform to make it much easier and do things that are hard to surround with services like uh, data protection, right? If you've lost data, it doesn't matter how many people you throw at it, you can't recover it, right? So that's kind of the starting point. And you're going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the approach we've taken is, is to take a, a software product approach to the training as well. So we rolled out on-demand training. So it's free, it's on-demand, you work at your own pace, it's got different modules, there's some training associated with that, or some hands-on labs, if you will. Um, we launched that last January, so it's basically coming up 
the year anniversary we recently celebrated. We've trained 50,000 people uh, on, on Hadoop and big data. Um, today we're announcing expansion on Spark classes. So we've got full curriculum around Spark, including a certification. So you can get Spark certification through this, this MAPR on-demand training. Okay. Go ahead, George. You said something really, really intriguing that I want to dive into a little bit. You s where we were talking about the small decisions that can be made really, really fast without a human in the loop. Human might have to train them, but it, at runtime. Now, where you said it's not about asking bigger questions, it's finding faster answers. Um, what had to change in your platform or you know, the, uh, the underlying technology to make that possible? You know, um, there's a lot that goes into it. It's typically a series of functions, uh, a, a kind of breadth that needs to be brought to the problem as well as squeezing out latencies. So instead of um, the traditional approach, which is different applications and different analytic techniques dictate a separate silo, a separate you know, scheme of data, and you've got those all around the organization and data kind of travels and you get an answer at the end of some period of time, uh, it's converging that all together into a single platform, squeezing out those latencies so that you can have an informed action at you know, the speed of business, if you will. And um, let's say Spark never came along. Would that be possible? Yes, yes. How, um, would, you, how would you do so it? So if you look at you know, kind of the, the different architectures that are out there, there's typically deep analytics, in terms of you know, let's go look at the trends, you know, the last seven years, what happened, and then let, let's look at um, doing actions on a streaming set, say for instance, Storm, and then let's do a real-time database operation. So you can do that okay. with, with HBase or MapRDB and all of that together. What Spark has really done is made that whole development process just much easier and much more streamlined. And that's where a lot of the excitement's happened. So you mentioned earlier um, two, two use cases, ad tech and fraud detection. Um, and I want to sort of ask you about those and the state of those. So ad tech obviously has come a long way, but it's still got a ways to go. I mean, you look at, I mean, who's making money in ads? Obviously Google, they're yeah. making tons of money. Everybody else is sort of chasing them. Facebook making money, probably because they didn't let Google in. <laughs> so how will Spark affect sort of that business? Uh, and, and what's MapR's sort of role in, in evolving that you know, to the next level? So, so um, there's, there's different kind of compute and the, the types of things you can do um, on the data. I think increasingly we're seeing the, the kind of streaming analytics and, and making those decisions as the data arrives. Right. And then there's the whole ecosystem in terms of how do you coordinate those flows of data. It's not just a simple, here's the origin, here's the destination. There's typically a complex data flow. Um, that's where we've kind of focused on map our streams. This, huge publish and subscribe infrastructure so that you can get real-time data the appropriate location and then do the, the right operations. A lot of that involved with Spark, but not exclusively. Okay, and then on fraud detection, um, obviously come a long way, sampling could have died. Yes, and so yes. And now, but now we're getting too many false positives. <laughs> you get the call and you go, I mean, I get a lot of calls because we buy so much equipment, but, um, but now, what about the next level? What are you guys doing to take fraud detection to the next level so that when I get on the plane in Boston, I land in London, it knows? Um, is that a database problem? Is it an integration problem, a systems problem? And how, uh, what role do you guys play in solving that? Well, there's, there's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of details and techniques that probably go um, beyond you know, what, what we'll share publicly or what our, our customers talk about publicly. I think in general, it's the more data that you can apply to a problem, the more context, the better off you are. That's the way I'd kind of summarize it. So that instead of a sampling or instead of a, boy, that's a strange purchase over there, it's understanding, well, this is Dave Valenti and this is the full body of, of uh, expenditures he's done and the types of things and here's who he frequently purchases from and here's kind of a transaction trend It started in San Francisco, went to New York, et cetera. So, in context, it would make more sense. So, 
part of that is more data, <clears throat> and the other part of that is just better algorithms and you know better better learnings and applying that on a continuous basis. How are your customers dealing with that that constraint? I mean, if they got a hundred dollars to spend, yeah, they can only spend so much on on each of those, gathering more data, cleaning the data, they spend so much time getting it ready versus making their machine learning algorithms or whatever the, th the other techniques to do. What are you seeing there as sort of best practice? It probably varies, I'm sure, but give us some color on, on um, that. I'll actually go back to Google, and you know, Google uh, uh, led our last round, um, you know, excellent, excellent insights coming from Google. They wrote a paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. And in it, they basically squarely address that problem. And given the choice to invest in either the complex model and algorithm or put more data at it, putting more data had a huge impact. And um, you know, my simple explanation is, if you're sampling the data, you have to have a model that tries to recreate reality. If you're looking at all of the data, then the anomalies can, can pop up and be more apparent. Mm -hmm. And um, the more context you can bring, the more data from other sources, so you get around, you know, a better picture of what's happening, the better off you are. And so that requires scale, it requires speed, and it requires different techniques that can be brought to bear, right? The database operation, here's a streaming operation, here's a deep, you know, file machine learning algorithm. So there's a, a lot of vendors in the sort of big data ecosystem are coming at Spark from different angles and um, are, are trying to add value to it and sort yeah, of yeah, bathe yeah. themselves in sort of the halo. Yep. Now, you guys took some time up front to build a converged platform so that you weren't trying to wrap your arms around 37 different you right, know, projects. Right. Can you tell us how, having perhaps not anticipated Spark, how this converged platform allows you to add more value to it than other approaches? So, so we simplify, if you look at the Hadoop ecosystem, it's basically separated into the components for compute and management on top of the data layer, right? The Hadoop distributed file system. So how do you scale data, how do you protect it? That's very simply uh, what's going on. Spark really does a great job at that top layer, doesn't do anything about defining the, the underlying storage layer. In the Hadoop community, that underlying storage layer is a batch system. So you're trying to do you know, micro-batch kind of streaming operations on top of batch-oriented data. What we addressed was to take that whole data layer, make it real-time, make it random read-write, converge enterprise storage together with Hadoop support and Spark support on a single platform, and that's basically the difference. We're, and to make it enterprise great, you guys were really the first to lead Absolutely. that, that chart. You were Everybody started talking about enterprise grade after you were kind of de delivering it. So you, you've had a lead there. Do you feel like you still have a lead there, or is that the kind of thing where you sort of hit the top of the S curve uh, and, and you, you start innovating elsewhere? NC State did a study uh, just this past year. A uh, recent study identified that only 25% of data corruption issues are identified and properly handled by the Hadoop distributed file system. 42% mm -hmm. uh, of those are silent. So there's a huge gap in terms of quote unquote enterprise grade features and what we so provide. So yeah, silent data corruption has been a problem <laughs> for you know, decades now and, and you're saying it's no, no different in the Hadoop ecosystem, especially as, as mainstream businesses start to, uh, to adopt this. What's happening in the Valley? Uh, we're seeing you know, in the Wall Street Journal every day you read about down rounds, flat rounds, people can't get B rounds, uh, you guys are funded, you know, you're growing, you're talking about investments. You know, what do you see? Do you, do you feel like you're achieving escape velocity? Um, maybe give us sort of an update on uh, the state of the business, if yeah, you Yeah, I, th I think the state of the business is best represented by the customers, right? And the, the customers kind of vote, right? They vote in terms of, you know, how well is this technology driving their business? So we've got a recent study um, uh, that kind of shows the, the returns that customers um, are getting. Uh, we've got a 1% churn, so 99% retention rate with our customers. We've got uh, an expansion rate that's, that's unbelievable. We've got multi-million dollar customers in, uh, in seven of the top verticals and nine out of the top 10 million dollar customers. So we're seeing significant investments and more importantly, significant returns on the part of customers where they're not just doing a single application on the platform, but multiple applications. 
Jack Norris and Matt Barr, always focused. Always a pleasure having you on theCUBE. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right, Thanks, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. The Cube. We're live from Spark Summit East. We'll be right back.